Um, a lot of what I'm interested in is artificial intelligence for robotics. And this is inspired by this video here, a lot of my work is inspired by this video here, which is a video of the PR1 robot. This robot was built by Keenan Weirbeck, Eric Berger, Franz van der Loes, and Ken Salisbury in 2006. And what you see here is a video of a robot doing a lot of the chores that a lot of us wish robots would be doing for us. This robot is actually doing it. Um, but there's a little bit of a catch. And the catch is that there is a harness that they also build, and Eric Berger is sitting in the harness and orchestrating every single motion this robot is making and foot pedaling the robot around. Um, but, <laughs> but from a computer science point of view, this is nice. This is a proof of concept that if the mechanical engineers and electrical engineers stop working, we can have robots that do things as long as we computer scientists would finally come through in our part of the bargain and write the software to automatically control this robot. So that's the AI problem. This is a robot, um, but these are all robots too. This is a Da Vinci robot. Um, so this is a surgeon controlling a robot here. There, the surgeon controls this robot, which, which you can think of as a joystick, a fancy joystick, which in turn moves this robot, which is called the slave robot, which is going through a very small incision inside the patient. And so there is two end effectors inside the patient, sometimes three, a stereo camera. And so the surgeon can see through the stereoscopic camera in here what's happening inside the patient and gets immersed essentially in the patient and this way about half a million surgeries get done each year in the United States. Um, again, very similar story. Surgeon is teleoperating, joysticking around the robot that's doing the actual work. If somehow we had better AI software then you wouldn't need this part, the software would take care of it and you would directly operate on the patient with software and this part of the room. Cars, same thing. We've been driving as people for many, many decades and still pretty much every car is driven by a person, not driven by a computer. It might change in the near future, hopefully, um, but we're still not there just yet. And then the flight, same thing there. Some things get flown autonomously, but once you're in the vicinity of a lot of obstacles, usually there is humans involved who navigate the in this case, a little drone around maybe um, buildings and so forth. So all of those are examples of robots where we have the physical capabilities, but we don't have the artificial intelligence to actually power these robots. And there's a lot of work to be done to get there. And a lot of the work that we're doing right now in my group is inspired by what we've seen happen in one aspect of the puzzle, which is computer vision. So one thing these robots need to do is to be able to look at their environment and understand what they're looking at. And so the way computer vision was often solved until 2012, or often uh, tried to be solved until 2012, was you have an input image, but if your camera just changes viewpoint a little bit, the pixels will change a lot. If the lighting changes, the pixel values will change a lot, because an image, an input image, is just a bunch of numbers reflecting how much red, green, and blue there is in that part of the sea. So since there is this sensitivity, people would do all kinds of pre-processing, for example, hog pre-processing, which makes it into an edge map rather than the original image. And that pre-processed image would then be fed into a support vector machine, which is a relatively simple learning system that can, if you give it enough examples of something relatively simple, can learn the mapping from input to output for, let's say, you give it an image, and then it should predict whether it's a cat, a dog, or a car in the image. This is what people were doing until 2012. It didn't work all that well, but a lot of the innovation was happening here, thinking about how you can re-represent your image in a more invariant way to lighting, viewpoint, and so forth. It's really hard to make that work. How hard? Um, ImageNet is the standard computer vision benchmark. Horizontal axis is time, vertical axis is error rate, so lower is better. Every year there's a competition being held. You can submit your software that then participates in the competition, gets fed a few thousand images for which your software then has to recognize what it is that's in the image. A cat, dog, car, and so forth. There's a thousand categories to choose from. Only one of them is right. Um, so these are the error rates of the different entries in 2010. These are the error rates of different entries in 2011. Here is 2012. If you look at the trend, 
It's essentially flatlining. Even though a lot of effort is being done, this was and still is one of the most central problems in computer vision that people try to resolve, understanding what you see in an image. But in 2012, something changed. A new approach came on the scene, uh, deep learning, which landed right there. Dropped the error rate from about 25% down to 16%. People realized this new approach is working a lot better, and everybody switched over to this new approach, except for one person over here with this blue circle. Um, but everybody else did, and you see that not only was there a leap forward, that is just something that gives you a boost, it actually is a new methodology that was still in its infancy in many ways here and is being further developed to get even better and better results every year still. In fact, these days if you read in, it, uh, in the news about AI, probably about half of it would be the stuff Stuart is thinking about. Will AI kind of take over the world? The other half will be more positive and will be about the results that are being achieved and a lot of these results that you read about are being achieved through deep learning where, let's say, Google announces now we have 5.1% error rate on this, Baidu says a month later, 4.8% error rate, and so forth. This is being pushed very, very hard, also specifically on this benchmark here. Um, in speech, the same thing happened. There was traditional approaches graphed in blue, and then deep learning approaches in orange. Now, what is this deep learning business? Um, it's inspired in many ways by how the brain works, Take this very loosely because nobody knows how the brain works, but it's inspired by what people think the brain might be like. And so the brain consists of a lot of neurons. A single neuron is visualized here. There is a center part, and then there's a lot of, um, on one side there are dendrites, on the other side there are axons. So the dendrites are the inputs of the neuron over here. There's all these inputs coming in coming from other neurons or coming from your eyes or your ears and so forth. And then this is the output, the axon, which then splits and goes to other neurons who take that as their input. Um, okay, mathematically or circuit-wise, we can visualize this as this. Essentially, there's some processing unit over here that takes in a bunch of inputs and then generates an output. Let's bring that up even a little more and make it a little more mathematical. This is your processing unit. You have, in this case, two inputs, but it could be more. This could be the first pixel in the image, second pixel in the image. But it could also be a neuron that processes something more complicated that gets inputs from other neurons who have already pre-processed things for this neuron. Um, then what this will do, it'll associate a weight with each of these input channels. That way you can make one input channel more important than another one. In general, you might have about 1,000 or 10,000 inputs for a real neuron, but here on the slide it's just two. And if you had a thousand inputs, you have a thousand weights of how important each one is relative to each other. And then the activation that you trigger on the, out, on the output of the neuron is weight one times its input signal plus weight two times its input signal. So let's look at an example. Let's say you are setting your weight one equal to one and weight two equal to one. Then what this unit is doing, it's computing the sum of the two inputs. It's one times input one plus one times input two. So that's the sum. You set weight 1 equal 1, weight 2 equal negative 1, then you compute the difference between the two inputs. These are just two choices. You can put any number there for the weights. This is just to illustrate that depending on your choice of weights, this neuron will compute something else. And the magic is that this neuron will choose on its own what it's going to compute. It has the power to change its weights within the brain, which in the brain would be strengthening or weakening enough connections it can decide its weight, and as a consequence, it can decide what it will compute from its inputs. Um, so that's critical. It's, you can think of this as the neuron programming itself. Normally when you program, you write pieces of, a piece of code. Here, the way you program this thing is by choosing what these weights are. Okay, so if you want to do then machine learning with a single neuron, we can now do this. What does it mean to machine learning? It means to choose a good set of weights here. And you learn those weights from examples. So let's say you get examples. Input 1 is 1, input 2 is 0, and the label, the output that you want is 1. Input 1 is 1, input 2 is 1, then the output you want is 0. Then you can say, oh, well, that's actually input 1 minus input 2 is what we output. And so a neuron that sees this type of data, if it were to successfully learn the pattern, it would say weight 1 is 1, Weight 2 is negative 1, and that way you can now explain the data. Right? And so you can essentially program itself from examples. 
And in general, machine learning with these kind of things comes down to recovering a good set of weights that are sitting on all these neurons to represent the mapping you see in your examples. Okay? So, you don't need to restrict yourself to one of these, you can put many of them together. And so here's an example of how deep learning tackles computer vision, sketched out. You get an input image. Now, I just threw two, four, six, eight units here, but is this, if this is, let's say, 100 by 20 pixels or something, then that's a total of 2,000 pixels, then you'd have 2,000 input units here. Each pixel goes to one of these. So these are all the pixels. Then from there, you connect to the next layer. For example, this unit here gets inputs from everywhere in this case, and so it computes a weighted sum of all of these pixels. And so the, whatever it decides to put in its weights is going to determine whether it triggers on something or it doesn't trigger on something. Same true for all the other ones, and these are the next ones, next ones. And so in practice, what you can get in this kind of representation is that this one, for example, could be a mask that looks like an edge. So the weights would essentially be a picture, correspond to a picture of an edge, and then if you get an edge, it would trigger on that. If you don't get an edge, it wouldn't trigger. And then this might be a vertical edge, this might be horizontal, diagonal, and so forth. And then this recovers low, this recovers low level information. This would recover combinations of edges. You get shapes out, and so forth. And then at the very end, you say, do I get the right combination of edges, circles, and so forth? That make for a cat, a dog, and then the last one will fire. And whichever one fires the highest here is the thing that you say, that's the thing that I'm going to say I saw in the image. Okay, so that's how it makes decisions. Now, keep in mind that the weights that are sitting here completely determine what it'll do, and the weights are being learned from data. So you don't tell it these are the weights, you actually feed it data. So you would build a data set, a bunch of images of cars, a bunch of images of cats, a bunch of images of dogs. You feed them into this learning process, and I haven't said how this works, but the simplest way to think of it is to say, let's say you try all possible settings of all the weights, and then for all possible settings of all the weights, you pick one setting and you see how often, how often does this calculation activate dog the most for this, and dog the most for all here, cat the most for all here, and car the most for all here. You pick another setting of the weights and you can score each setting of weights by how often those weights result in the right decision. And then you retain the weights that result most often in the right decision. Practice you cannot enumerate all settings, you have different ways of finding those weights, but that's what it effectively does. Of course, some of you might say neural nets. We've seen that in the 50s, we've seen that in the 60s, I see somebody nod, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, now the 2010s. Um, it keeps coming back, and why is it going to be any different this time around? Well, one thing is that you saw the results are essentially revolutionary now compared to what they used to be. So it somehow works better than it used to. You might ask yourself the question, why is that? What if people figured out that they didn't know before that now all of a sudden you can recognize things in images, you can recognize what people say, and you couldn't do that before. Well, part of it is just the change of the times. Um, a lot more data is being made available, so the quality of weights that you recover depends on how much data you fit into this system when it's trying to find its weights. And so, in this case, the image recognition system that we saw for that competition has 1.2 million images that were labeled with whether it's cat, dog, car, horse, and so forth. Then, to generate even more data, because it gets pretty tiresome to label these images, you can recrop your images. And that way you get a multi multiplication of the number of labeled images by a certain factor of however many reasonable recrops you can do. Then you can recolor your images. In fact, you can make them a little more bluish, a little more reddish, a little more greenish, a little darker, a little brighter, and so forth. It'll still be the same thing in the image. And so that generates even more examples. Compute power, it's good to have a lot of labeled images, but if you cannot actually find the weights that are good and predicting what's in those images, then there's no point. So this took the result that I showed you, the first kind of breakthrough result, took five to six days of compute time to recover the weights. That's, you might say five to six days, I'm happy to wait five to six days. But keep in mind, you're waiting five to six days, but at that point, you don't know even yet that this is going to work. And so it might return garbage after five or six days. Maybe not total garbage, but something that's not really that great. And now you have to look at it, inspect it, see what is it doing well, what is it doing not so well, what should I change 
about the architecture of the neural net, what should I change about how I try to find good weights and so forth, and then you go again. So if this were, let's say, just 50 or 60 days, just a factor 10 longer, it would probably be impractical to go through that iteration process, right? So definitely in the 50s or 60s, people stood no chance iterating through designs of neural nets and so forth and algorithms to optimize them because it would take too long. Um, some tricks people came up with or, or technical innovations. Um, I talked about the activation of the neurons, some weighted sum of inputs, right? It turns out what actually happens after you take the weighted sum of the inputs, you get a number that you put on this axis. And then you use this function to decide what output you're going to have. So if you have a high weighted sum of inputs, you become a one. If you have a medium weighted sum of inputs, you get something intermediate. If you have a negative sum of weighted inputs, you get a zero on the output. That's what people used to have. A little remindful of how the brain works, you fire or you don't fire, right? But what people found mathematically works a lot better is after you compute the weighted sum of inputs, you put it again on this axis here, but then if you're positive, you just keep whatever it is. If you're negative, you zero it out. Um, why is that? It turns out when you optimize the weights, you want to find the best setting of the weights, you don't just try everything. You have a current setting. You change it a little bit, your setting of the weights, and you see if it does better or worse in predicting labels that you need to predict. If most of the time you're out here in saturation or out there in saturation, a small change of the weights has no effect on your output because you're already saturated. And so it's very hard to optimize weights by making small changes to them if you're constantly in saturation and this is more amenable to that. This speeds it up about a factor 10. So without this, it would take about 50 to 60 days if instead you use this. Interesting idea, drop top. The idea there is you have a neural net that does all kinds of calculations, but you want it to be robust. So you're actually going to tell it to every now and then just zero some things out that are not zero. So it fires, but you say, I'm going to overrule that, you're just not firing randomly. And you still are required to compute the right thing. And that way it needs to be very robust and can't just rely on very quirky things to get the right output. Um, a lot of ideas have to be kind of figured out of, do you want eight layers, 10 layers, 24 layers, how many units per layer, how do you want to wire them up? That's a lot of exploration of model structure and a lot of optimization know-how. So what I've shown you, neural nets I projected have maybe a few thousand parameters at most. The ones people work with have billions of parameters. So that's a lot of numbers, a lot of weights that you're trying to recover. Um, but that's interesting. So we used to do computer vision like this. Now it's done like that. Instead of being an expert in image formation to make progress on computer vision, which you had to be in the past, now you have to be an expert in neural net learning to make progress on computer vision. Now let's take a look at robotics. Robotics actually looks a lot like the old pipeline in computer vision. You get perceptual inputs, you hand engineer something that then makes an abstraction of what the world is like around the robot. Then you have some ideas of how the robot should react to what's around it. So you write out some code for that, maybe with some free parameters that you tune by hand or it learns to set to some good setting. And that results in the motor commands. Well, why not just drop in a big neural net? Essentially, this is, this is just code, this is just calculations. A neural net, as we've seen, through choosing its weights, can do fairly arbitrary calculations. Um, let's just drop a neural net in there, give it enough weights, enough freedom, and hopefully it'll find the correct weights such that it does. Well, otherwise we'd be doing here with a lot of effort to figure out, it would just figure it out on its own. That's the hope. There's a catch though. You might say, well, it works for speech, works for image recognition, aren't we done for robotics then too? In robotics, you need to deal with the consequences of your actions. So after you take an action, in some state you take some action A, what happens is the robot and the environment change. And then you're asked to take an action again and this repeats. This is very different from image recognition or speech recognition where you're just given a bunch of data and you ask, let's have you make some predictions. Here you need to deal with the repercussions of what you just did. Learning-wise, what makes this very different is that now you need to explore your world, understand what's possible, what's not possible in your world, rather than just being fed that there are labels for things. The other thing that makes it very difficult is that, let's say you're learning to do something. Let's say you're learning to cook a meal. Now let's look at an extreme case. The robot just is scrambling around in the kitchen, and if it's just randomly scrambling around, it's never going to even pick something out of the fridge till day two or three. It's going to take forever. And then once it picks something out of the fridge, it might not even realize that was the right thing to do. It might just drop it on the floor. And so 
you, you, only when you give it supervision will it be able to draw conclusions. And so the simplest kind of supervision that you might use is if I'm happy with the meal, great. If I'm not happy with the meal, I didn't see a meal show up at all, bad. Then the robot will be busy for years before finally they show up with a meal that maybe you like a tiny little bit. And so this delayed reward is really difficult to deal with when you're learning because now when the robot finally shows up after five years with a meal for you that you liked, it will wonder what in this past five years actually mattered to make this meal good and what did I do that was essentially a waste of time, right? And so this delayed reward makes it a much harder learning problem. Now nevertheless, people have started to tackle this and here's one example where you can get a lot of data because when does it work well to learn a lot of weights in a neural net when you have a lot of data? So here are some Atari games, these are games from the 80s and these are relatively simple games You say, well this is not like chess, I'm just playing Pong, but actually this is much harder than playing chess. And the reason this is much harder is if you want to learn to play this game, the way this is set up, as a computer, you're challenged to learn from just seeing the pixels on the screen. Nobody tells you you have a paddle you can control. You're just shown as a neural net, you're shown the pixels and you're given a joystick axis and that's it. Nevertheless, you set up a neural net network that goes from pixels to joystick actions. You can run this and there's been a few people who've done this and successfully learn to play those games. Now, it takes a good amount of experience, it takes about a few days of, of training, but still, it's possible to learn to, to play these games, meaning learn a vision system and learn a control system at the same time. Um, what's interesting is that if you compare with human level performance, you actually have about half of the games in the benchmark suite. It's possible to learn to play as well as humans, the other half not. This often has to do, the more the reward is delayed, the longer it takes. Let's say you play, play Sequest, where you need to bring a submarine under the water, find a diver, bring it back up at the right time, then you get a very delayed reward and it's very hard to learn to play. But games like Pong, where once you miss a ball, you immediately get told that you missed it and you, you, you don't win, then it's easier to learn. Um, but effectively, this is what it looks like, a neural net is sitting there. We can do the same thing for robot control. So let me show you a robot control where the input to the neural net, joint angles, joint velocities, and the surface you're on, output is essentially muscle activations or for a robot that's motor commands. This robot is getting rewarded. The further it makes progress in the forward direction, the higher the reward. And the harder it hits the ground, the lower the reward, in fact, it goes negative. We've never told it what walking is, we've never told it what um, running is, but it figures out over time that the right way to get high reward is finding some kind of gate. Here, you see at the top iteration 640, that means this was the 640th setting of the weights in the neural net that it was trying out. And so over time, iteration 2000, it has found a really good set of weights and it does very well. You can run the exact same piece of code, but now have it control this four-legged robot. No reprogramming needed. Just interface it with this robot instead of the other robot, and here it goes, and it learns to run with this robot. Um, in fact, for this one, it learns to run very fast. Faster than probably is uh, physically possible, but the simulator allows it, and so it figures out it gets very high reward in the simulator by uh, speeding up so much. Um, last iteration, then the last experiment I want to show is one where the, it gets rewarded for how high its head is up. The higher up the head, the better. And so it keeps trying to get its head as high up as possible. It's getting more and more reward. Now note that I didn't say it gets rewarded when the head is at a specific height and zero everywhere else. That's the reward shape. And we shape that it knows when it's improving a little bit. And so it can tune its weights to get better and better and find a way to get all the way up. I think we're running out of time. So what I want to leave you with is um, First, a video of the robot, our actual robot, learning something like stacking a Lego block here. Um, it learns this in about 20 to 40 trials to get that block in place. But I also want to leave you with some thoughts about kind of when you think about robotics, um, what many people don't realize, um, but this was stated back in the 90s, but essentially it's comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligence tests. Like maybe a few weeks ago you saw saying, oh, this computer passes like the IQ test for a four-year-old. But these tests are actually relatively easy to get a computer to do. What's, or playing checkers, which is very structured, what is 
much harder or nearly impossible is to give a computer or a robot the skill of a one-year-old or a two-year-old. The visual motor skills that they acquire, the ability to acquire new things, the learning they do is much harder to get a computer to do than these structured things like IQ tests or checkers or chess and so forth. Thank you.